It's, it's unbelievable the degree to which our sanity depends on a functioning sociological structure. Well, first of all, you kind of need to know what to do every day. You have to have a routine because you're an animal, you know. And, you know, if you have a dog or a cat, dogs are a really good example of this. Dogs like routine. They like to be walked the number of times a day that they're supposed to be walked. And they get quite sick very rapidly if you don't, if you don't routinize their, their days. Children are exactly the same way. Now, you can overdo it, right? But still, you know, you need to know approximately when you should get up. It should be approximately the same every day. You need to know approximately you're going, when you're going to eat. You need to know what you're going to eat. You need to know who you're going to eat with. You need to know where to buy your food. It's like 80% of your life, 70% of your life, something like that, consists of those things that you do every single day, that you repeat. And those are often the things that people think about as the trivial elements of their life. But one of the things I would like to point out to you, if you do the mathematics, I, I did this with a client of mine who was having a hard time putting his child to bed. They were having a fight every night. And I knew by that time, the studies indicate that most parents only spend 20 minutes per day of one-on-one -on -one time with their child. Now, the reason for that is that people are busy and it's actually not that easy to parse out 20 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time. It's a lot bloody more time than you think. But that's all there is, 20 minutes. And he's spending like 40 minutes a day fighting with this kid trying to get the kid to go to bed. And that's not very entertaining. You know, you think, well, it's just having a scrap with the kid about going to bed. But it's no, 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 no. If it happens every day, it's a catastrophe. So you do the math. So we'll say five hours a week for the sake of argument, just to keep it simple, it's 20 hours a month, it's 240 hours a year, that's six 40 hour work weeks. So that guy was basically spending a month and a half of work weeks doing absolutely nothing but having a wretched time fighting with his son trying to get him to go to bed. Horrible, right? That's just way too much time to spend doing something like that if you want to actually have a positive relationship with someone because it's just too, it's just too punishing. And so, well, so you need structure, you need predictability, and you need more of it than you think just to keep you sane. Now, if you're lucky and, and maybe a bit odd, you can deviate 5% from the norm or 10% from the norm or something like that carefully and cautiously as long as the rest of you is all well-ordered in a normative manner. You might be able to get away with that, and you might be able to sustain it across time, and people might be able to tolerate you if you do it, or maybe you'll get really lucky and you happen to be creative, but reasonably well put together, and people will actually be happy that there's something idiosyncratic and unique about you. But even under those circumstances, mostly what you want is to have a routine that's disciplined, that's predictable, and bloody well stick to it. You're gonna be way healthier and happier and saner if you do that. And then the other thing that you need because this is one of the things the psychoanalysts got wrong, I think, is that they overestimated the degree to which sanity was a consequence of internal, of being properly structured internally, you know? Because from the psychoanalytic point of view, you're sort of an ego, and that ego is inside you. And of course, it rests on an unconscious structure, but the purpose of psychoanalysis is to sort out that unconscious structure and the ego on top of it, and to make you a fully functioning and autonomous individual. But there's a problem with that because the reason that you're sane as a fully functional and autonomous human being isn't because you've organized your psyche, even though that's important. The reason that you're sane if, you're a we if you have a well-organized unconscious and ego is because other people can tolerate having you around for reasonably extensive periods of time and will cuff you across the back of the head every time you do something so stupid that people will dislike you permanently if you continue. And so what people are doing to each other all the time, just nonstop, is broadcasting sanity signals back and forth, right? It's like you smile at people if they're, well, if they're not, not only behaving properly, but behaving in a way that you would like to see them continue to behave. You frown at them if they're not, you ignore them if they're not, you shun them, you, you roll your eyes at them, you manifest a disgust face, you don't listen to them, you interrupt them, you won't cooperate with them, you won't compete with them. It's like you're blasting signals at other people about how to regulate their behavior so frequently, well, it just makes up all of your social interaction. That's why we face each other and we have emotional displays on our face and we're looking at each other's eyes and we know exactly 
We know as much as we can about what's going on with each other, given that we don't have immediate access to the contents of their consciousness. And so partly what you're doing with your routine is establishing yourself as a credible, reliable, trustworthy, potentially interesting human being who isn't going to do anything too erratic at any moment. And everyone else is around there tapping you into shape, making sure that that's exactly what you are. And that's how you stay sane. And so what happens to people too, if they don't have a routine and they get isolated is they start to drift. And they drift badly because the world is too complicated for you to keep it organized all by yourself. You just cannot do it. So a lot of our, so we outsource the problem of sanity. And it's very intelligent that we outsource the problem of sanity because sanity is an impossibly complex problem. And so the way that we manage the incredibly complex problem is we have a very large number of brains working simultaneously on the problem all the time. You can work on micro habits with regards to your conscientiousness. And I think the best micro habits, this is partly to do with this future authoring program processes. I think the best thing you can do with regards to your conscientiousness is to set up some aims for yourself, goals that you actually value. And the future authoring program helps people do that. And basically it does a, a situational analysis of, it helps you do a situational analysis of your life more than a psychological analysis, I would say. And so, so the questions are something like, well, all right, you're gonna have to put some effort into your life and you need to be motivated to do that. And so what are the potential sources of motivation? Well, you could think about them in, in the big five manner. You know, if you're extroverted, you want friends. If you're agreeable, you want an intimate relationship. If you're disagreeable, you want to win competitions. If you're open, you want to engage in creative activity. If you're high in eroticism, you want security. Okay, so those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on, that you could tailor to your own, you know, your own personality. But then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across. And so we ask people about, well, you know, if you could have your life the way you wanted it in three to five years, if you were taking care of yourself properly, you know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you going to regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health? And maybe also your drug and alcohol use, because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out, you know, five to 10% of people. So you want to keep that under control and then and then so maybe you know you 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 develop a vision of what your life what you would like your life to be and that associates the so the goal well, once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement the micro processes become rewarding in proportion in relation to their uh, causal association with the goal and that tangles in your your incentive reward system. You know, we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system, and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward. And the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day, you're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal, you, you do that, you do that in some sense as a unique individual, you want to, you want to specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Because the question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything? And the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how Look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. That's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's, that's, a, bad, that's a bad deal for you.